Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the National Girls Collaborative Project National Webinar, Reach Across the Stars, Meet Your Female Space and Science Heroes Virtually. We're really excited to have you all joining us today. And we're especially excited to have a fantastic group of NASA STEM professionals, scientists, and an astronaut joining us for this webinar. So thank you to those who responded to the poll there on your screen. Um, this is a webinar in celebration of National Mentoring Month. So we thank you for thinking about mentors and role models in your life and those that you use in your programming. And we'll learn a little bit more about that today. So I'm going to end that poll and just share with you a little bit of our sort of housekeeping items before we get into our presentation. So as you have noticed, probably your microphones are muted here in this meeting. We ask that you please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. We will, however, have time towards the end of this hour where we will open it up to Q&A from the audience. You can either type questions for that Q&A right into the chat box where you're all responding now, or you can choose to use the hand raise feature, which you can find if you click on the participants tab. And that will allow you to raise your hand virtually. We'll see it on our end and you can actually unmute and ask your question yourself live to our panelists. So that is an option as well. Um, I am now going to get us started. So thank you so much. If you have any technical questions, oh, I'm, I forgot one more point of order. Hold on one second. I am going to turn on our live transcription. So you should see transcription occurring on your screen right now. Um, you can view that transcription as it is, or if you click the more tab in Zoom, you can see the full transcript and read all of the speech that is being said. So again, my name is Marissa Garcia. I'm here on behalf of the National Girls Collaborative Project. I am a female, with brown long hair, wearing glasses, and a striped gray and black sweater today. And we thank you and welcome you for joining us at this webinar. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the vision of National Girls Collaborative Project. So the vision of the National Girls Collaborative Project is to bring together organizations committed to encouraging girls to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and computer science. The photos you see here are just one example of how we facilitate discussion among stakeholders by offering structured networking activities at every NGCP and local collaborative event. During collaboration networking, dynamic discussions between individuals matching needs and resources can highlight ways for organizations to work together to impact the youth they are serving. We all know that there is a diversity of high quality resources available, and many of you have little time to search for the strategies and content to improve your program. NGCP helps you address this need via our website, our newsletter, online databases, social media, and webinars, just like this one. NGCP also seeks to strengthen the capacity of programs by sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. When programs are stronger and more sustainable, Girls are better served. We distribute these resources in an accessible format via Train the Trainer programs, partnerships, and online platforms. And finally, we use the leverage of a network and collaboration of girl serving STEM programs and champions to create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. The National Girls Collaborative Project engages in a number of activities virtually and nationally, as well as through collaboratives. NGCP partners with organizations to scale and deliver content such as Leap into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute and Crypto Club in partnership with the University of Chicago, both funded by the National Science Foundation serving hundreds of educators via statewide networks. NGCP also manages the Connectory, the largest national database of STEM opportunities. The Connectory also provides a way for program providers to connect and collaborate with others. Fab Femmes is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They're passionate about the work they do and are ready to connect with programs to spark girls' interests. NGCP is also working with Lida Hill Philanthropies and has launched the If Then Collection, a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These media are available at no cost. 
We offer regular webinars, just like this one, focused on research and exemplary practices and resources to help our network grow and thrive. Locally, state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings for educators and resources, researchers for professional development, and mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available. They also distribute their own regular newsletters spotlighting local resources. The National Girls Collaborative Project has been partially funded by the National Science Foundation since 2002. We began as the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project focused on Washington and Oregon. And then as we presented our collaboration model to others, we were invited to expand across the United States. While NGCP programs and partners are located in every state, we have collaborative leadership teams in 41 states. Today, NGCP facilitates collaboration between more than 38,000 organizations serving over 20 million girls and 12 million boys as well, since many of the organizations serving girls are also serving boys with engaging STEM curriculum and activities. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the webinar today. Um, first, we have Dr. Kimberly Cowell Arkand, who is a visualization scientist and emerging tech lead for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, which has its headquarters at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Arkand is an award-winning producer and director. She is a leading expert in studying the perception and comprehension of high energy data visualization across novice expert spectrum. As a scientist, as a science data storyteller, she combines her background in molecular biology and computer science with her current work in the fields of astronomy and physics. Arkand has been pioneering an astronomy, data visualization, 3D printing, and virtual reality. She led a team of researchers to launch the first ever data-driven virtual reality application of a supernova remnant using NASA observational data. We also have Christina Hernandez, a space enthusiast and self-proclaimed nerd who is an aerospace engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, where she works as an instrument engineer on NASA's newest rover mission, Perseverance. The Perseverance rover is a robotic scientist that has launched, its, that has launched on its own journey to the red planet. Christina's job is to make sure that the instruments we send to the Martian surface are designed, built, and tested and operated correctly so we can retrieve all the science we can. We're also thrilled to be joined by Sasha Samoshina. She is an Emmy award-winning creative technologist. She joined the team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory after working in New York in the fields of video and web development and in Chicago, where she was a media producer at the Field Museum of Natural History. After dreaming up content for JPL's communications department, she began to explore the world of 3D videos and XR. Through Sasha's visualization skills, she pioneered the very first 360 degree video release on social media for NASA. She is a project lead for ProtoSpace and the technical group supervisor for the user interface development group at Jet Propulsion Lab. And finally, we're joined by Nicole Stott, who is an astronaut and artist who creatively combines the awe and wonder of her space flight experience with her artwork to inspire everyone's appreciation of our role as crewmates here on Spaceship Earth. Nicole is a veteran NASA astronaut with two space flights and 104 days living and working in space as a crew member on both the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle. Personal highlights of her time in space were performing a spacewalk, the 10th woman to do so, flying the robotic arm to capture the first HTV, painting a watercolor, working with her international crew in support of multidisciplinary science on board, the orbiting laboratory, and of course, the view out the window. Nicole is also a NASA aquanaut. In preparation for spaceflight, she was a crew member on an 18-day saturation dive mission at the Aquarius Undersea Laboratory. She is founder of the Space for Art Foundation, uniting a planetary planetary community of children through the inspiration of space exploration and the healing power of art. Her first book titled Back to Earth is currently in the works. So thank you so much to our fantastic speakers today. We're going to start with hearing from Kim Arkand, who's going to share a little bit about the app that she created with her team that really inspired this webinar today. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Marissa. This is really nice to be here. We have a 
few inches of snow outside, so it's nice that I actually don't have to leave my house today. Um, I am a female with blonde hair that currently has a little purple and blue in it, and I'm wearing a blue sweater, so clearly blue is my favorite color. I am just going to talk a little bit about the app, and then we're going to move into the panel because I'm sure really what you all want to hear about um, are some of these amazing women and what they're doing. So on the next slide, I'll just give a little bit of background on, on why we created this application and what the application is all about. Um, I've been, as Marissa mentioned, working with 3D models for a while, and um, we have sort of created this collection of 3D data sets and assets that just had a lot of potential, we thought, for learning. And couple that with a few years ago, I was giving a talk in my daughter's class. It was her fifth grade class. And after talking about exploded stars and doing a little origami exercise where we talked about how supernova remnants can sort of unpack like you can with origami, um, one of her classmates came up to me after that lesson and just said to me that I didn't know mommies could be scientists. And I think it sort of hit me again um, as someone who had been underrepresented in the field for quite a long part of their career and having looked around and seen that the number of women in STEM could definitely be improved, we were hoping to create an application that brought some of these real 3D data sets and brought them into the hands of students, um, particularly. So I had met Sasha. Uh, she is just fantastic and inspiring. And we had had some conversations and toward each other's work environments. And one thing just sort of led to another. And we proposed for this project with the American Women's History Initiative at the Smithsonian with additional funding from NASA's Chandrax Observatory, in-kind supports from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and then finally got some additional longer-term support from NASA's Universe of Learning. So about uh, a year later, we are still working on this app and trying to continue it and get it into the hands of students. What it does is bring, as I mentioned, these real 3D data sets, these real sort of work environments that scientists are actively involved in and bringing them quite literally into your hand. So on the next screen, um, we'll just see, for example, a, a really quick view of Mars. And this is a fantastic 3D data set of Mars um, from the Curiosity rover, if I'm recalling. And part of this idea is that you're not just getting the data set, but you're getting the story of the scientist who has worked on this type of material. Uh, so in this case, it's Dr. Ellen Sofan, who currently heads the Air and Space Museum in DC. And so you're getting to sort of interact with her through these questions and answer sessions on video. And then you're hearing her voice as you go into this 3D environment. And then you also get to explore this 3D world. And in the next screen, There are other ways to interact through the app, such as, for example, see yourself as a scientist where you get to do these little selfies and you know, select if you wanna be a biologist, an engineer or some other field, which has been really exciting. And next, we're just gonna walk through a couple of these augmented reality data sets that we've mentioned. The first one that is playing now is a 3D model of the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A. And we did this with Dr. Wanda Diaz, who is an astronomer and computer scientist who is also blind. And so there is a data sonification element to this as well, where you can hear the data of the various elements of um, material that are being emitted in the supernova remnant. So you can hear the iron, the silicon, the argon, the neon, you can see them as they're represented in this three-dimensional model. Next. There are additional um, workspaces as well. Astronaut Cody, Katie Coleman actually takes us on a tour of the Chandrax Observatory. And here you're seeing it as it was launched um, from Space Shuttle Columbia, for example. Uh, Katie is extraordinary. And she was the person actually responsible for deploying the Chandrax Observatory back in 1999. So it talks a little bit about her stories and her trials and tribulations, and then also talks a little bit about the science as well. And on the next screen, Now we're looking at a supernova um, and resulting pulsar. So this is the Crab Nebular and pulsar. And here we hear the story of Dame Jocelyn um, Burnell and she is talking about the nebula 
and all of her incredible experience working with this. And I just have to say that most of these little screenshots were actually filmed by one of my colleague's daughter <laughs> because they live right near the ocean. Um, so this was really fun to see. And on the next screen, This is just a really quick view of one of our new modules where you get to explore the ISS along with Sunny Williams. She takes you on a tour for some of the modules. And on the next screen, oh, we are back to Mars again, um, which I mentioned already. So I'll skip that and go to the next screen. And now this is Christina's section working with the Mars rover Perseverance. And she takes you through all the bits and pieces of it and talks about some of the really incredible stuff that, uh, that it will be doing. And on the next, now we are looking at a spacesuit and getting an in-depth look at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab along with uh, Jessica Watkins. And I have to say, as someone who never learned how to swim, I tried desperately <laughs> and failed miserably. I really, really love this module because you actually feel like you're underwater and you get to sort of pan around your room and you feel like you're in that, that huge pool, um, learning how to be an astronaut along with Jessica, which is pretty exciting. And the next screen, I think it brings us to the panel. Thank you so much, Kim, for giving us a quick tour of the app and all of the great, amazing features. I myself have downloaded it and used it a bunch, and it's really fun to um, get to try those different AR features and like put them in your kitchen or you know on your porch or when you're out on a walk, like at the beach. Um, it's just been great and also fantastic to hear the real voices of these females speak about the work that they do. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you all can see our wonderful faces. I will change it to speaker view for the sake of the recording. And we are going to move into a panel. So we're going to start this with some um, just questions that we've prepared in advance before we open it up to the audience for your questions. So of course you can feel free to continue typing questions into the chat. I see some coming through. We will definitely address those. Um, but for now, we're gonna start with some of these prepared questions. So um, I'm going to just read the questions out and those who are feeling the you know, desire to respond, please jump in and share your responses. So we will start with, um, who was a key mentor or role model in your life and how did they support your endeavors? I'll go if no one else is. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't know if we're supposed to do our intro about who we are. So um, Nicole here, I'm a female with long dark hair. I'm in my office studio surrounded by lots of astronaut art. And um, one in particular is this big colorful art spacesuit behind me. And I've got on my spare glasses that make my eyes look huge because I broke my real ones. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, the mentor thing is really uh, interesting to me. I, I, uh, I find that throughout life, I've I've thought about it a little bit differently, actually. There's times where I'm actively thinking about, oh, this person is supporting me in some way, about them being a mentor uh, at a given time in my life. And then I think what I've really appreciated is when I look back um, kind of in hindsight and say, wow, these people were really there lifting me up at different times, um, supporting me in a way that was very positive, almost kind of without me even knowing that that was, was happening. And I'll tell you, I think the number one of those people, and I can still say it today, is my mom. I know, you know our parents in a lot of ways um, are those people for us. And my mom, for sure, um, every step of the way, supportive of me, even when I was wanting to do things that I know she would never choose to do herself. And that might've been scary to her, but she continued, um, you know, to encourage me to, to be curious about those things and to try to do my best at them. And then, you know, she was right there watching as I launched on a space shuttle two times. And I mean, that takes a lot of strength for a parent to be able to do. And as a mom whose son just soloed for the first time in an airplane, um, 
now I know how she feels. But uh, I think that's our place, um, not just as parents, but as uh, just as supporters for the people around us. I will piggyback on that. Um, I'm Sasha Samoshina. I'm a female with dirty blonde hair, wearing glasses and a black shirt with a colorful background and my little tiny alien friend here. Um, so I would, I would say my brother was one of my biggest influencers as someone that was always interested in art, um, but he also pushed kind of math and computer science on me um, because he really didn't take no for an answer. I would say like, I'm bad at this, I don't get it. And he's like, let me explain it to you in a way that you will understand because this is very understandable. So he built this confidence in me of being like, you can understand this, you can learn to communicate it. And it sort of made my passion in software systems engineering um, have those both halves of both loving art and then being able to understand the technical part. So I owe it to, to him. Um, he also made up a character when I couldn't go to sleep um, that jumped from different planets. And so he secretly made me memorize all of our planets and more things about our solar system, um, kind of in a sneaky way. So hats off to him. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to uh, piggyback on the idea of, you know, family uh, being mentors and especially, you know, we have a lot of educators here. I think in my experience, right, it, we, we always think of role models as, as folks that we see ourselves in. You know, for me, it was like Elena Ochoa, the first Latina uh, to go into space, or it was, you know, all these amazing women who were scientists and engineers that I was learning about. Fundamentally, though, when it came to who pushed me and who motivated me, it always came back to my parents who I feel enabled me to ask really annoying and pestering questions and never said no to trips to the library, trips to the museum. They always you know, ignited that fire. Um, with respect to you know, educators, there was a turning point um, where uh, my grad school professor actually was the one who convinced me that I was smart enough to do grad school, which I think really changed my experience as an engineer. And so given that, um, I think uh, it's really power in the people that surround you most um, or people that advocate for you. And I totally forgot to describe myself. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I have a very interesting uh, appearance. Uh, my name's Christina. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. Um, I have magenta hair uh, that's in a messy bun with a leopard print headband. And I've got a 3D printer in the background and a, um, a boxing stand. Um, so that's my surroundings right now. <laughs> I, I love that. And I just want to jump in really quick. I'm not going to talk much in this segment because I want to hear everybody else. But I just I have to give a shout out to my family as well. And I love what everybody has said so far about um, the people that you're surrounded by. You know, for me, my mom was a huge inspiration growing up just supportive. Um, she was working as a waitress and realized, you know, she couldn't raise kids on that salary. She wanted to try doing something different. And she went to night school. So I remember sitting under my dining room table while she was at night school, taking classes to be a, an assistant nurse. And I would like steal into her anatomy books and look at all these like disgusting illustrations, which were awesome. And that was such a moment for me to like see someone learning as a, you know, a grown up um, while taking care of kids and all that. And that just has stuck with me for my whole life. I mean, I've pretty much been in school my whole life. So I guess it really stuck with me, but um, I love this idea of mentorship from the people who are around you. So thank you everybody so much. <sighs> thank you. Um, our, our next question is a little bit related to um, Christina's reflection upon how sort of her in one of her professors sort of convincing her that she could do grad school and that it, it was worthwhile and it was something she was capable of. Um, so the question is, when did you know you wanted to work in STEM? And what were the most important steps you took that helped you enter into your career? I can go ahead and uh, try that one out a little bit. So for me, um, it was very interesting. I, I, you know, I described the 3D printer in the background. I, I, it's like the, the idea of tinkering is a relatively new concept for me. I actually wanted to jump into STEM because of exploring through books in the library 
I love reading. I love science fiction. And I wanted to be able to make that happen. And so for me, exposure through reading and, you know, PBS's Nova with all those really cool documentaries that they have weekly, that's really what got my imagination riled up and, and wanting to learn more. And through that process in understanding what it took to send somebody uh, to the space station, go to Mars, go exploring Venus, um, I learned, ah, you need to be able to tinker and, you know, get your hands dirty and try things out. And so that was my, my mechanism and my gateway to becoming a professional tinkerer. And, and I love that, Christina, the, the tinkering side of things, um, uh, whenever you discover it, I think it's really, it's what brings, to me, it's what brings all of what we study to life, right? To really be able to get your hands in it, to, to understand the reality of what, you know, all this theory is and, and how it can help us, you know, improve life around us. Um, I, I'm probably the oldest one here. And I have to tell you, when I was figuring things out, there was not an acronym STEM. <laughs> didn't ex it didn't exist at the time. And I, when I think about it, it's really, um, I, I, I go back to the parent thing again, where I had these two people that just shared what they loved with, with me and my sisters. And, and that's probably because they wanted to do those things they loved. And they figure, okay, we got these kids, we'll take them along with us. But um, it really had a way of rubbing off on us so that we knew we could be curious about things and figure out what we enjoyed. And some of that, like for me, my dad built and flew small airplanes. So I got this love of flying, I think through the exposure that I had through the things he loved. And my mom, very creative person, you know, she sewed all of our clothes growing up, which I can't even imagine. I mean, I joke that I can't even make it to Target to get my son new underwear or something, you know, let alone think about <laughs> sewing all of his clothes. But I developed a real um, kind of Sasha, like you said, about this intersection with science and art and how those two things can come together. And, and I love what you said too, Sasha, about um, it's kind of like the, the learning sneaking up on you, right? And how you really, I don't know, I think you get, you get the most excited about it when it happens that way. And then you, you, know, you want to go off and learn more. And so I think for me, it was just, you know, there were things I was really interested in and they happened as far as career or studying at school went to be in this science and technology side of the world that I didn't, I don't think purposely choose choose it that way. It was just, wow, here's, I want to know how things fly. What do you study at school to do that? Somebody tells me that's aeronautical engineering. Okay, I guess I'll study that. And if, if, if they had told me how difficult it was, I don't know if I would, <laughs> if I would have chosen it myself, but it, it was the thing that, you know, helped me, you know, do all kinds of other stuff, um, opened up all kinds of opportunities. Yeah, I think that's really kind of the way it, it, things build on each other. I love to use that term, like trick yourself into learning or trick people. And it's, it doesn't, I don't mean it to sound menacing, but sometimes you're like, oh, wait, I just learned something amazing. And you sort of are like, I love this idea. I mean, I'm, a, I'm originally from Russia. I was born in St. Petersburg and my family moved to America at a very tumultuous time when the Soviet Union was falling and my dad took a big risk. Um, my parents are both in STEM, you could say. My dad's an engineer and my mom is a chemist. Um, and as they gave up those careers in Russia, they gave me this wonderful idea of when we moved here, basically like you can do anything you want. You can create your own path. It is possible here. It is not possible where we came from. Um, unfortunately, that was the world um, of Russia then. And so I had this sort of uh, endless possibility realm. I think one thing that really influenced me was video games, kind of connecting the idea of how technology and art can come together into something that you can not only learn from, but then I figured out you could build things with it too. And then the internet was coming up and becoming a bigger deal. And suddenly it's like, oh, you can make websites all about horses and cats. And like, I love those things and I'm going to explore that. Um, so on an early development stage, I think all of those things were really huge for me. And then um, actually during college, it was that job that um, Marissa had mentioned at the Field Museum that truly connected science and art for me because I started working on data visualization to help stop um, deforestation in the Amazon with the environmental conservation programs at the field. 
museum in Chicago. And that work was very small. It was a small group of scientists, field scientists, as well as scientists in the museum doing this incredible work and needing me to show this data visualization through technology that suddenly the thread was so, it, I just saw the universe open up. I was like, this is what I wanna do. This is the feeling connecting all of it together to then make change. Um, and from then on, I was, uh, I was like, I will always work in a field that connects science to people and to education. And so, um, so I'm trying to continue to do that to this day. That's, that's awesome. It, it, I'm not sure if you saw, but um, Heather had commented in the chat here that she loves that everyone's talking about science as a part of so many other things. And I think that really resonates with what you just shared, Sasha, about you know your experience working at the Field Museum and creating those visualizations. And just science is really, it's a human endeavor and it's something that is in everything we do all the time. And so finding those ways that it really connects to people and I think is just such a powerful way to go about thinking about science and STEM. Um, so our next question is, as a role model here in this webinar, or if you are one of those featured in the Reach Across the Stars app, what advice would you give to young girls and young women interested in aerospace careers or careers with NASA? Okay, I was like, who's gonna unmute first? <laughs> um, I think for me, what really jumps up at me whenever I hear this question is, I spent so much of my time growing up scared to get my hands dirty um, out of fear of, you know, me, I, I, was, a, I was a good student, right? I, I didn't wanna get the answer wrong. I didn't wanna embarrass myself. I didn't wanna disappoint my parents. Like, you know, all the feelings that you feel, you know, when you're learning something. And I spent so much of my time in that, that I never really got to just jump into things until I had that right push. And that for me came later on. And so what I would recommend is, you know, try and move past the fear, right? You know, be proud of failure and just like really jump into it and, and be super excited and passionate. I think, you know, all of us on this panel have experienced that. And I think the sooner you, you learn that and can grow the, you know, accepting being a troublemaker and shaking things up for science and engineering, um, I think you'll, you'll be better off for it. Yeah, you know, I, I love that. I, can I say ditto? <laughs> because I think it's, I think it's, for me, it really helps me think about, because um, I, I felt that way too. You know, there's this, this tendency, and you know, Kim and I have done an event before where I think we talked about this, this, I, I hate to stereotype anything, but I think young women, we tend to second guess ourselves like way too much, you know? And we, we hold ourselves back in a lot of ways from things that are really are available to us, right? And I mean, I can use the example for myself. I was jumping into things. I was flying airplanes with my dad. I knew I wanted to learn about flying. Um, I'm old enough, like, you know, the old lady was able to see the moon landing. I'd been inspired by that. But when I think about having the opportunity, really the blessing to fly in space as an astronaut, I, I think, I, I mean, I almost sabotaged that for myself because I didn't believe why would they, I was, it was always second guessing. Why would they ever pick me? Yeah, that's a really cool job, but you know, that's what other special people get to do. Um, all of it, all of these questions that are crazy when, when you really think about it, because what it did was it made me not take the one step that I had total control of, which was filling out the application, right? Nothing fancy, um, nothing that would hurt me or even cost me any money. But I, if I didn't do that one thing, I would not even be, there'd be no chance of it. And so mentors really for me, um, when, I, when I think about that again, it's like there were these people that I trusted enough to just say, hey, I'm kind of thinking about this astronaut thing. And all they did was encourage me to pick up the pen and fill out the application and to do that one thing 
that I had total control of. Now, now they might say, oh, Nicole, you made the greatest astronaut there ever was. They didn't say that at the time. And I'm just joking. But, um, but they encouraged me to do the one thing that I already had total control of. And um, I think we need to be really careful not to doubt ourselves um, out of the will, just even being willing to do those things. Yeah, I believe I yesterday I read a statistic and I'm don't quote me on this, but there was some sort of statistic that said that women applying for jobs feel like they need to be 100% qualified, whereas men applying for that same job feel like they need to be like 70% qualified. Um, and that's something, you know, one of my positions is a group supervisor, which might sound a bit boring in terms of management, but part of my job, what I do within the, the system of the work that I, that I'm in is, you know, encouraging a lot of younger women to go for it, you know, apply for this position. Just like you said, Nicole, like if you don't apply, how are you ever going to be considered and applying doesn't take that much. And then you're suddenly like, wait, hold on. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Like you're reading the description and you're like, this is me. I mean, that's exactly how I applied to my job at JPL five and a half years ago, completely without knowing anybody there. Uh, it was my dream job. And I just blindly applied. And later on, after I was hired, I asked my manager, why did you consider me? And she said, your resume was just so weird and interesting. I just had to meet you. And I was like, you know what? That's great. <laughs> it's like, I'm weird on paper, weird enough and like have enough experience. She's just like, I couldn't put it together. You, you seemed very qualified, but you seemed very interesting. So I think taking those risks. Yeah. I, again, triple ditto that um, just going for it is, is very important and it builds your confidence over time. It makes you not have this thing that is so often talked about, about imposter syndrome, about thinking that suddenly you are the expert in something and then doubting yourself. It sort of makes that go away after time. And the sooner you can get into that zone of confidence, the, the better um, you'll feel uh, as you grow into, into your career. And I know I promised I wouldn't talk much for the session, but I just love this topic so much. <laughs> I just have to say, um, I think talking about fear and failure is really important because those can be things that while difficult to go through can be like these mechanisms for a sort of self transformation. Um, you know, for me, I failed genetics in college, and this is when I was hoping to be a molecular biologist. And I thought the world was going to end because if I couldn't do this class, how could I do anything? But honestly, that the sort of series of, of things that led from that failure put me on a direct path to working for a NASA mission where I've been for over 20 years and been very, very happily employed doing lots of weird stuff, sometimes with Sasha. Um, so I think this idea that you know failure can be so scary is true, um, but it's also so necessary. It's such a necessary part of learning. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, that was such a, as you said, Kim, such a great conversation and, and topic. And I love kind of the path and many roads we went down and talking about sort of entry points into careers. Um, we're gonna, I think, transition into questions from the audience. So audience, um, if you would like to ask your question live, if you click on the participant um, tab, you should have it, the ability to raise your hand if you look under your name. There should be a button which will show us that you're raising your hand ready to ask a question. Um, we are also tracking the questions that came through the chat. So we'll start with one of the questions from the chat that will give folks a moment to raise their hand if they are interested. And don't worry if your question is in the chat but you don't want to ask it yourself, I am happy to read it for you. So from the chat, um, we had a question coming from Karen North. She is asking, how do we motivate more teachers and administrators to get this app and these types of resources into the hands of students? Um, Karen's been trying to get connections with NASA in Houston, scaled up for decades as a teacher in Houston. Um, do you have any advice for kind of getting these great resources out there? I can try to start with that one if, if everyone likes. Um, I, I love your question, <laughs> particularly hearing, you know, how can we get this app into more hands? Um, a lot of the work we've been trying to do is with other groups like NASA's Universe of Learning, for example, to work with existing programs 
to be honest, when we first planned this app, we would we had expected to do it um, to put it into the hands of users directly during workshops that we were hosting at the time. But then the pandemic happens and that plan has had to change. So we are really still looking for help and support on getting the word out. It was selected as an as an Apple store app of the day. So that that did give us a nice little perk up um, in, in user interactions. Um, but again, getting it more directly into the hands of students would be fantastic. So I don't per se have an answer. I would just say if you are interested in working more with um, NASA organizations and centers, um, if you could just send me an email after, I'd, I'd be happy to, to chat a little further. And I, my email should be up at the screen at some point. I was going to I was going to echo you, Kim, because, you know, at JPL, for instance, we have a whole education department and education site, which provides monthly content for extracurricular and also in class learning. Um, now being virtual, they've actually pivoted to a lot of video content, a lot of things like that. So that department, I know, at least for our center is really helpful um, and they do try and um, weave you into a program on a larger NASA scale, for instance, at Johnson Space Center in Houston. I'm sure it's harder um, to do that. They're a little bit of a bigger organization focusing on other things. But yeah, I would say if you email Kim and myself, I'm happy to follow up with the resources and contacts that I have to sort of try to fuse together your, your educational goals with, with NASA as well. And that's, you know, I, both, I think that uh, that's such great, uh, just a reminder that NASA has these education um, resources available, but I just want to put a plug in for, um, I believe every NASA center has uh, like a, a visitor complex associated with it. And most of my work has been um, with the Johnson Space Center, um, you know, Space Center Houston or at Kennedy here in Florida with the KSC Visitor Complex. And the folks there, especially through their, their education uh, groups are, I mean, they just know where all of these, these resources are. So hopefully, like um, Kim, you guys have made them aware, aware of it too, but um, I would just encourage people to reach out to them. Um, they seem to be easier to access uh, you know, to get a response from than, than the NASA education groups themselves are just because um, I think the NASA groups are a little, um, you know, smaller and not quite as, um, you know, out there. But, uh, and I'll tell you, I, I'm going to take information about this app and share it with my son's teachers at his school. And um, I think if everybody starts doing that kind of thing, just reach out to your own local network uh, and, and share it with the people you know, it'll start to spread. Things like this will start to spread with, without us really even trying all that, <laughs> that much. Thank you. Um, and there are a lot of great, there's a lot of flurry in the chat right now about um, links to websites and folks who are willing to connect. So feel free to read through there and see um, some other ideas that people have had. All right, we have 11 year old Maria here waiting to ask a question. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute Maria. Um, I just wanted to ask some questions. My first question is, is when you were thinking of ideas and for like the space stuff, did anyone doubt you? Who wants to take that? I can start. Uh, I have a very real recent experience. Um, so Maria, A, that's a fantastic question. Uh, nice to see you as well. Um, I've been working on the Perseverance rover for the past six years. And in that entire time where we're like building things and testing things, very often a bunch of engineers and scientists get in the room and we start throwing ideas out there. Um, and sometimes um, I often felt, especially as I was a new engineer and still learning, um, that my ideas would sometimes be doubted. Um, but what was great is, you know, a lot of us have talked about mentors and advocates, which are basically like friends at work who have your back um, and they amplify your voice so that they can say, hey, Maria had this great idea. Let's let's hear it again and make sure we write it down and try it. And so I think very often um, that has been my experience where even if 
you know, I run into that um, at work. Um, you know, you have your, your, your work friends who have your back and really help advocate. And that gives you confidence to kind of ignore those doubts that we talked about. Yeah. And, you know, Christina, that's so great is that, uh, you know, speaking about the people that can kind of give that little nudge for you. Um, and Maria, I'd say, you know, start identifying those people now, you know, you know, start to recognize who your supporters are and, um, and, and go to, you know, take advantage of the, how they might know you even a little bit better than you know yourself. I mean, that's what I, I started to find like throughout my time in school and in work is like, wow, that, you know, just like the people who told me to pick up the pen, they might see something in you that you don't even necessarily recognize in yourself. Um, and, and the doubts that I dealt with was mostly my own internal doubt that I just encourage you don't do what I, don't do what I did. But one of the things I learned from one of my greatest mentors, um, and I always have it on this little astronaut guy here is um, this, this philosophy of here's how we can, not why we can't. And it's really incredible when you just, just think about that with any like challenge or problem you're presented with, if you just look at it from the standpoint, okay, how can I find a solution to this versus, oh, here's all the reasons why it might not work. It's amazing what really wonderful things um, can come from it. And I think that's how we got to the moon, how we're on a space station, how you're gonna go back to the moon for us and on the Mars. Awesome. Maria, did you have another question? Um, yes, one last one. If, if um, like, Nicole, when you gone to the moon or wherever you went, um, what would you say to the Earth if you're up there? Well, that's a good one. You know, um, I can think about it now because that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do is, is say stuff to the earth now um, at, based on the experience I had, right? And that's that, um, you know, we do all these really complex things. Um, everyone on this panel, I mean, I, I'm thinking about perseverance landing on Mars. I'm like, holy moly, that is a seriously complex thing to do, right? Having people from 15 different countries living on a space station together, that, That's a really, really complex thing to do. And yet um, the message that I come back with and that I ended up having while I was there, um, it's maybe not so much to the earth, but to the people of the earth <laughs> is, you know, um, three simple lessons. And that's that we live on a planet. We don't think about that very often in our day-to-day -day lives, that we are all earthlings and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. And those three things, I think, just define our interconnectivity, define how we all are just, you know, here, the who and where we are together in space. And when we think about those three things and every decision we're making, somehow they become, you know, the choices that we make become about more than just ourselves, um, which is why I love everything we're doing in space, ultimately about improving life here on Earth. Sorry, I'm a rambler. No, even, no, even <laughs> no apologies needed. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you, Maria, for those great questions. Um, we had a few more coming through the chat. We have a question from Adrian about Nicole's upcoming book. Is it for adults or for children? Well, I think it's, um, I would say young adults and up. Um, and there's probably, probably any of the children on this call today could, could handle it really easily. Um, it's, meant to, it's meant to kind of follow along with those three simple lessons and how the way that we've been as, as human beings um, representing these 15 different countries living and working in space on the, the space station the, how the way we've done that really, I think, models beautifully for us um, how we should be living like crew here on Spaceship Earth. So I think underlying it all, um, younger adult, and then I hopefully can spin off sometime with a, with a children children's book about it. Wonderful. And 
And Nicole, I'm going to keep you on the spot because a few of the other questions are, are specifically addressed for you. Um, some folks in the audience are really admiring that astronaut suit in your background and wondering, um, are they possibly made to order? Yeah. <laughs> if only, you know, it's funny because we've done these suits are part of the, the Space for Art Foundation work that we do with kids around the world. And this suit was built, I think kids from 50 different countries participated, hospitals, refugee centers, and <clears throat> excuse me, um, they're not made to order, but every astronaut now that sees them wants to know why their suit can't look like that and <laughs> why it has to be just white. Like, you know, I think uh, Hopkins and um, Victor went out the door today on a spacewalk with their white suits and red stripes on. And um, we all want the colorful ones now, but maybe someday we can get some pajamas or something made. <laughs> made out of the patterns, something like that. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, okay, another question for you, Nicole, about your experience working in the NEMO lab, the underwater lab. So can you share a little bit about that experience? And then also, do you know if that lab is still operating? Um, we have someone here who thought it would be a really incredible field trip for their students or like a virtual um, tour or a snorkeling scuba yeah. trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend it, by the way. Um, it's, it is still operating. Uh, Florida International University are the ones who, who operate it now down off of Key Largo. Um, they encourage field trips actually to their topside operation, you know, all the kind of their mission control and you can see the boats and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what what possibilities there are for getting out on the water, but I'm a never say never person. So, you know, you should look into that. Um, I know they have a lot of uh, student research that goes on. So that might be a way to get, you know, to get into where you could at least, you know, snorkel or be out on the boats. Um, and, I'll, and then I'll just sum up by saying it was absolutely the best analog, you know, the best model for what it was going to be like to live and work in space, um, a real extreme environment. We um, treated everything uh, on the undersea habitat just the same way we would if we were in space. And of course, once you're down at 60 feet um, for more than an hour, you can't swim safely to the surface without potentially, you know, risking um, hurting yourself or pot potentially risking your life by doing that. So we have to learn how to deal with uh, things that go wrong at 60 feet underwater with each other until we can safely get to the surface. So I don't think any better example of uh, how it is to live and work in space and real missions. Um, we, we build real mission uh, tasking into those, those experiences. Um, and so again, yeah, highly recommend. I actually, I believe that you can go onto Google Maps and tour the Aquarius habitat. Um, so they actually did a 360, mm -hmm. uh, photo walkthrough of the whole thing. Um, I had the pleasure of working with the crew two years ago. Um, we did a fully augmented reality training for um, them to both train and execute a procedure in the Aquarius Habitat using only augmented reality. So I got to say that was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Also, Nicole, just the fact that you can call yourself an aquanaut. <laughs> Still, I mean, astronaut's incredible, right? But aquanaut is like that next yeah. level of just mind blown. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, I think the Nemo guys, when we do, when we do the, um, when astronauts go and do training and become aquanauts, they've got some, I don't know if it's aquastronaut or astroquanaut. I, I don't know what it is, but they've got some weird name for the combo. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone. In an effort, um, I'm just looking at the clock here. So in an effort of time, we're actually going to transition um, back to presentation for a little bit because we just have a few um, new additions that are coming to the app soon that Kimberly wanted to just highlight real quickly before we say goodbye. So I'm going to screen share again. Thank you all so much for your great questions and responses. And I hope this conversation sparked lots of curiosity in yourselves. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. Wonderful. So for anyone asking about related activities or trying to think about how to incorporate this in, um, you know, beyond the classroom and facilitation programs or after school workshops, even if they're virtual for now, 
This is a very simple map that sort of uh, provides some examples of activities that you can link to depending on your students uh, interest. So for example, if you have some students that like the idea of math and space science, we have something called NASA Space Math and there's a link from this page. If your students are into coding, like it sounds like a number of us on this call are, I'm a coder, so I say we're all coders apparently. Um, there's quite a few activities that you can do using actual NASA data. We've got a couple coding activities in 2D images, essentially like make your own image of an exploded star. Um, work with 3D data of things like the Crab, Nebula, Pulsar, uh, or do some very simple binary code exercises and learn how space how to talk to a spacecraft um, from that section up top. If you're into um, learning how to uh, do things like understand the universe and cosmology, there's some links for that. If you want to go into space, we have some fun like uh, maker tinkering type of activities like Christina was talking about earlier. So. Um, there's just a, a map of different ways that you can progress with hands-on activities and also virtual activities. Most of these activities are in both formats, so you can either do them virtually or do something on like pencil paper. On the next slide, I believe we just have a, a quick preview of the two most recent modules that just went to the Apple Store. I'm assuming the app is live now in the Apple Store. I haven't actually checked. It, it was not quite live right before I dialed in, but it should be any minute. Um, and Sunny Williams and Jessica Watkins are our two most recent folks to join the interactive 3D sections of the Reach Across the Stars. Sunny gives a fantastic tour of the ISS and Jessica gives a really cool tour of the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, both of which I highly recommend. And I think the last slide is just contact information. So um, please do check out the app. And here is my email for those that were asking if you have ideas and suggestions or would like to collaborate further. I would really like to hear from you. I, I definitely appreciate everybody's time today on this so far. Thanks so much, Kim. And before folks um, leave us, we'd just like to do a quick plug for our upcoming National Girls Collaborative webinar. It is STEM Health and Mental Health happening on February 9th um, with the Gateway to the Great Outdoors and the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. So thank you so much for joining this fantastic webinar and conversation today. We were just so honored to have these fabulous speakers here to share their experiences of mentoring and role models and their experiences working on all of their creative and fascinating projects with NASA. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. And we also ask that you please fill a post webinar survey out for us. That helps us to improve our webinars in the future and just make sure we're providing our audience with content that is relevant, interesting, and helpful for all of you. So thank you so much. Oh, I see someone saying, I have a question, a final question. If you wanna type it in, we'll try and squeeze it in in the next couple of minutes. Let's see, oh, I'm not sure if I'm seeing it, but people are just very, very thankful. It was a valuable webinar. The sky is not the limit. I love that. <laughs> oh, someone's asking, do you know Catherine Sullivan? Does anyone here She's know awesome. Catherine Sullivan? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so Nicole, Nicole is in contact with Catherine. <laughs> All right, fantastic, everyone. Thank you so much. This was a really inspiring conversation and us at NGCP hope that we see you again for future webinars. And we hope that you keep in touch with Kim and some of the other speakers who presented today. Um, we will post the recording of this webinar as well as the slideshow and any related resources to the event page soon. So thank you so much. And please take a moment to fill out our survey. Bye everyone. Bye.